welcome everybody to uh, this evening's uh, joint Outer Temple Barnet Waddington webinar on indexation. Um, I'm Andrew Spink. I'm uh, you'll be pleased to hear not a speaker uh, or a panelist. I'm just here to chair the meeting and to introduce our our eminent speakers. Um, this is a very timely webinar given uh, the number of recent court decisions. Four of those were listed on the flyer that you were sent, Britvic, Arup, Atos, and Tyler's number two. Um, OTC have had a close involvement in all of those cases, both at Silk and Junior level. Uh, and the same goes for some other cases, particularly uh, the massive BT, which kept a number of us very busy until last year. Um, I'm delighted uh, to uh, introduce uh, Lydia Seymour, David Grant, Philip Steer and Nicholas Hill, who uh, are all juniors who've been in at least one of the first four cases that I mentioned. In addition, we're absolutely delighted to have um, appearing with us Richard Gibson, a partner at Barney uh, Waddingham, who's going to, in fact, speak first um, uh, and will give us a bit of background to RPI and CPI and talk about the, uh, 20, uh, the 2020 consultation that's going on at the moment. Before I ask him to speak, um, could I just uh, mention a couple of uh, facts? Uh, first of all, as you may appreciate, given the uh, breadth of the topics that we're covering and the number of speakers, each of the talks, that, mini talks that you're going to hear from our five speakers, uh, could it potentially be talks in their own right? Um, they're being deliberately pitched at a fairly high level um, in order, I hope, to pique your interest. Um, but please bear with everybody, uh, given that uh, there isn't the opportunity here to talk for a huge amount of time on each of the topics. Given the time of day on a hot day, perhaps that will be a popular move with you as well. Um, secondly, to remind you, I think you all know this, but the event is being recorded. Uh, you are all on speaker only. Um, we can't see you. Uh, lastly, um, we welcome questions. We think that the best way for that to operate is for anyone who wants to ask a question to use the chat function. Uh, I and our panelists will keep an eye on the chat questions as we go along. And then at the end, um, one or more of the panelists will answer your questions so far as they're able. Um, obviously, if you don't have questions, that's fine, but uh, we're happy to encourage uh, uh, certainly a few to be dealt with at the end. So thanks for attending. Uh, we're now up to a good number of attendees. So I'm going to ask uh, Richard Gibson to kick us off uh, with his presentation. Richard. Uh, good afternoon. Well, thank you, Andrew and the Upper Temple team for that. I'm hoping that everyone can see a, a slide window that I've opened here. Um, good afternoon. My name is Richard Gibson. I'm a consulting actuary and partner at Barnett Waddingham. Uh, and I've been asked by Upper Temple to contribute to the discussion today, partly because I spend a lot of time uh, advising pension schemes on issues to do with indexation and RPI. Uh, and I've been involved uh, as an expert advisor in some uh, litigation cases on this topic. Uh, but also because I am a member of the National Statisticians Advisory Panel on Consumer Prices. And in that capacity, I spend a lot of time talking to ONS and Treasury officials about the, uh, the detail that, that sit behind the, the acronyms of, of RPI and CPI. Uh, and it is, I must say, a hugely, for me, very interesting, but a hugely com complicated uh, area of subject matter uh, in RPI is a mammoth undertaking. Uh, producing it involves a survey of over 5,000 households every month and collecting 180,000 prices. So very detailed activity. Uh, and I hope I can shed for you a little bit of light on those indices today and what the current consultation is about. So, and I'm hoping the slides will track through here. Um, jumping straight in at the deep end, uh, it's, I find it useful to think about the differences between the RPI and the CPI index. So both of them are price statistics, um, which means they're based on identifying some sort of basket of goods and ser services that, uh, that the households or others uh, purchase um, and measuring changes in those baskets of, of, of goods. Um, but about there, the, the, the similarities tend to peter out a little bit, and I would emphasize there are significant differences between the origins of these two indices and the philosophy behind each of them. Uh, so the Retail Prices Index, RPI, uh, is, is sort of the granddaddy here, and it was uh, created in 
in its current incarnation in, in 1956. And its, its aim really is to try to measure the change in the cost of what UK households are, are buying. Um, so it's really just trying to measure uh, the, the inflation experienced by the average household. The CPI, by contrast, is a newcomer on the block, um, implemented by the Maastricht Treaty. It's a much more economic measure, trying to measure uh, exactly what it is that happens within the, the UK's economic territory. And the purpose of it, actually, originally was under Maastricht, to measure whether the different Eurozone economies were, were travelling at the same speed over time for monetary union. So a very different uh, origin of these two indices. And those different uh, philosophies and, and backgrounds permeate uh, a, a lot of the ways that they're, they're constructed and the differences between them. Uh, so, for instance, RPI, as a measure of the average household, excludes some of the highest income households and some of the lowest, uh, and tries to look at, at the typical household Whereas CPI as an economic index looks at everything that happens in, in the economy uh, within the UK, but is not interested in uh, the expenditure by UK households on, on foreign holidays. Not that there are a lot of those going on at the moment, uh, of course. Um, and the same points come through in, in other differences between these indices. Uh, I think the most significant other point I, I draw out on differences between these two indices is on housing costs, which are excluded from the CPI, along with council tax and, and other housing related payments. Um, and this has been a significant criticism of the CPI, because in the UK, we spend about a quarter of our income on housing related costs. Uh, so it does seem a significant shortfall. This is not part of the inflation measure. And to address that, the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, uh, introduced a, a third index uh, to this comparison here, which is CPI-H, which is the same as CPI, but it does include a housing element. And I'll, I'll explain the, the importance of that on, on my next slide. Uh, in terms of other differences between the indices, uh, the, the RPI is something that's under the control of the UK Statistics Authority, the UKSA. But because RPI is, importantly, the index that index linked bonds are, are, are referred to, uh, any changes to, to the RPI statistic must be referred to uh, the Bank of England to consider whether the change is fundamental and materially detrimental. Uh, and if it is, for, for bondholders, and if it is, then it must be referred to the Chancellor for uh, permission. And then why is it that we're so interested in this sort of slightly arcane comparison between two statistics indices? Well, this is the, the final difference on my list is the formula effect. Uh, and this you know, fairly well-known piece of technology, uh, terminology in pensions these days. And this arises because around a quarter of the RPI is linked to the Kali or the arithmetic formula. Uh, and since 2010, uh, this has led to uh, a differential of about 1% per annum between the inflation measure between these two indices, so quite significant financially. I want next to talk about uh, the last 10 years uh, in the history of, of RPI and how that's led up to the changes being proposed uh, at the moment. And uh, from my perspective, uh, RPI begins to feature, or the, the question about RPI and CPI features very heavily in pensions sphere for the first time in 2010, for two reasons. One is that uh, in 2010, a change was made to the collection of clothing and footwear data uh, that had an unintended consequence of causing the formula effect to uh, arise or increase. And that's led to RPI increasing much faster than CPI. Uh, since 2010. The other change in 2010 was the coalition government's decision to base statutory indexation on CPI. Right? Uh, and uh, fast forwarding then to 2012, uh, by this point, the, uh, the formula effect issue that had been introduced in 2010 was better appreciated. And the National Statistician, along with CPAC, which is the predecessor body of the the uh, committee that I sit on, uh, consulted uh, publicly on whether something should be done, whether the National Association could make a proposal to address this formula effect differential between RPI and CPI that had significantly expanded in 2010. Uh, they were, I, I think, uh, rebuffed 
uh, it's fair to say, slightly in that consultation response. And in the end, the national statistician, she decided to make no change to the index and indeed went further and said, we're going to freeze the RPI and not make any future changes to it. And that led to uh, the loss of uh, by RPI of the national statistics status later that year. And then falling on to the, near the end of this timeline, uh, why is it that we're, we're talking about a consultation today? Well, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee uh, looked at this continuing issue and sort of lack of confidence that had been engendered in RPI back in 2018. And they concluded that something ought to be done about this and even suggest, went so far as to suggest that the 2010 change to clothing and footwear ought perhaps to be, be reversed in some way. Um, National Statistician and, and UK Statistics Authority considered that proposal and they came up with uh, changes uh, to the RPI, which I'm about to talk about, um, to, 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 to meet the, uh, the challenge set down by the House of Lords. Uh, and that's led to the present consultation. So, so what is the consultation? Well, the National Statistician, I think, surprised a lot of people uh, when he said uh, last year that the RPI should be abolished. And if it can't be abolished, it should at least be moved in line with CPIH. Uh, and CPIH is expected to be significantly lower than RPI over the long term. Uh, and as the sort of the colourful flowchart on the page shows, uh, that proposal uh, made by the UK Statistics Authority on the National Statistician's advice was referred to the Bank of England. The Bank of England, I think, correctly identified it would be fundamental and materially detrimental. Uh, which means that it cannot be made before 2030 uh, and must have the Chancellor's permission to be made uh, any earlier than that date. Uh, and the Chancellor, uh, in fact it was Mr Javid in his brief tenure at the time who considered this, said, well, I'm not going to abolish the RPI, but uh, I need to consult on whether I should make these changes to, to, to the RPI any sooner than 2030. And that's brought us to, to the current consultation. I think what I'd emphasise here is the decision has been made by the UKSA. So this is positioned very much as a, a when, not if consultation around making these changes. So whether or not our, our guys should move in line with CDIH is, is not part of the, the question uh, being put in the consultation. So what is in the consultation? Uh, well, it, it's a pretty short read actually. You're very welcome to have a look at yourself. It, it describes pretty briefly the, um, the proposal, which is to completely replace RPI with the mechanisms of CPIH uh, with effect from 2030 or, or earlier, uh, and will have a one year transitional period to achieve that. It identifies this pretty small list of issues that the Chancellor will have as relevant considerations in deciding whether or not to make that change earlier than 2030. It says that sub indices like RPIJ will not in future be published. Um, and it also invites comments from, from broader RPI contract holders on, on implications. There are a number of points it does not address. Uh, and for me, the most important of those is that if we do go ahead and converge RPI and CPIH in the future, I wouldn't want to see the indices diverge again. Uh, and it, there are some challenges around that. There's the issue of the freeze, which I explained, which was introduced in 2013. And there's also the issue that RPI as the index of record for guilt is not allowed to be uh, revised or restated once it is published. And the other issue, unsurprisingly, which did not appear in the Treasury's consultation, was the one of compensation for guilt holders, which I don't intend to dwell on extensively in this talk, but I, I think it's fair to say that many index-linked guilt holders are, or were originally holding out some hope that they would be compensated for any loss of value uh, as if, if RPI is expected to fall in the future. So uh, from the actuary's perspective, any change like this has winners and losers. The, the winners on the left-hand side of my balance sheet are generally those who uh, have an obligation to pay, uh, make payments linked to RPI, which will in future be expected to be lower. Uh, and, and the losers are those who have been receiving RPI. Uh, so in theory, receiving something less valuable in the future. And from a pension scheme perspective, that is very much schemes and sponsors who generally have the RPI linked obligations. Um, and those losers in pension schemes are actually called the majority as well as obviously members who are the end receivers of these benefits, it's often schemes holding RPI-linked assets um, who are losing out here because those assets fall in value 
And if they if they're holding RPI linked assets because they wanted to to hedge CPI linked liabilities, well their liability hasn't changed, but their asset value has. Uh, and it's, so it's it's those schemes who unfortunately are seeing um, deteriorations of funding positions, sometimes about ten percent uh, from this proposal. On the winning side of the balance sheets as well, it's worth mentioning the taxpayer, who I think can do with a, a bit of help uh, at the moment. So look, I, I, I've sort of rocketed through that, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're keen to hear from the barristers on, on contentious issues, but I, it, it may be helpful if I sort of pose a few issues in the pension scheme context that the, these proposals sort of raise from my perspective. Um, that schemes may want to revisit, particularly with the help of some legal advice. Uh, and so the first row of these are for those schemes who are currently paying out RPI. Um, and things to consider are, are your scheme rules triggered if you have triggers in the rules um, by these proposals, these proposed changes to RPI? Uh, secondly, you might be sitting on your, your current RPI payments uh, as a suspension scheme and thinking, oh great, this, this change will come into, pl into play and my obligations will become less onerous um, a little bit down the line. What I would say is that um, you know, our, our, our inflation markets continue to be quite volatile. You know, inflation is not going away, um, as, and potentially Mr. Sunak's borrowing spree, um, you know, we could see higher inflation a number of years down the line here. So there is still 11 years potentially of RPI exposure left in the scheme, even if these proposals do come into force. In 2030 plus a provisional year, um, which I think crystallizes perhaps a need to think about your RPI exposure and whether you want to continue it. Um, schemes offering pension increase exchange or who have offered those high terms will want to think very hard about the mechanics of continuing to offer that, whether the factors could be changed, whether potential future changes to the index uh, ought to be considered as a blocking factor. Uh, and then the bottom line of this slide here, that's on the middle line, I suppose, uh, addresses those those schemes who uh, have already moved to CPI, perhaps through exercise of a discretion. They may wish to revisit that sort of decision. Um, one point worth bearing in mind is that guilts, uh, the, the guilt hedging instruments are linked to RPI, uh, and so once these changes come through, will be linked to CPIH. That means that CPIH from a sort of investment perspective is a more attractive type of liability to have because it can be hedged more precisely than the CPI. Um, and so will we see a state of scheme switching from CPI to CPIH at some point in the future uh, or investigating whether they can do so? Uh, and finally, um, I, I think I've sketched out the direction of travel the, uh, the ONS have gone through where they now declare CPIH to be their favoured index, having moved from RPI RPIX, from RPIX to CPI and then on to CPIH. Is it possible that statutory indexation could change in the future as well? Uh, there are many other practical challenges, which I'm sure will be a talk in their own right that we've been working through with pension schemes to address indexation recently. But at this point, I'm going to pass across uh, to Philip. Philip, uh, I think you have control there. Richard, thank, thank you very much uh, for that excellent introduction. I've just been asked to remind you um, uh, that we actually have a Q&A facility on this webinar. So participants, if you, if you think you've um, heard something that you'd like to ask a, a question about or probe a little bit more detail, please use the Q&A function. And then at the, at the end of the hour, we'll try and uh, pick out um, one or two of those questions and, uh, and, and, and answer them for you. So, um, with that uh, uh, said, let me um, try and share the screen into my own presentation. There we are, that seems to have happened successfully. Um, just a word about the, about the title that we collectively came up with. I mean, Richard has done an excellent job, I think, of uh, setting up some of the issues we wanted to look at from a, a legal point of view. We have uh, a history since 2010 of systemic pressure away from RPI and towards alternatives, principally CPI started, I suppose, perhaps, perhaps not started, but certainly represented by the coalition government's uh, uh, series of changes to uh, the measure used for, for indexation of public pensions and also the revaluation percentage for statutory valuation, and therefore for LPI in certain, in certain guises from RPI to CPI. And that's uh, something that created employer pressure because of course, 
uh, it was quickly appreciated that CPI would produce lesser increases. And we've discovered, as Richard has explained, that if you like, there's real um, denting of the credibility of RPI in technical terms. The, the intellectual balance is all with CPI and other measures which are associated with it and away from RPI. And I suppose the question we thought was worth posing was, well, has, have the courts picked up on that zeitgeist? Are they uh, looking for ways to help schemes uh, uh, modernise their indexation provisions by uh, slipping out of the RPI uh, uh, stranglehold if they've got one in their rules or are they actually uh, not with the zeitgeist but rather with some other uh, more literalistic uh, approach to uh, escalation provisions and scheme rules and um, you know that, that is really the general question that looking at, at it from a variety of points of view we thought was interesting to pose and I'm kicking off with uh, a sub question which is, is is there some kind of inbuilt bias in pensions legislation towards RPI as the measure of inflation that that gets used. Uh, and I think the suggestion I've been making in broad terms is yes, there probably is uh, for, for one key reason, which is the way in which uh, statutory minimum increases uh, for pensions and in, in payment were introduced in, in the 1995 legislation, which of course came into, into force in April 1997. And I think the, the key takeaway that uh, I, I want you to, to get from this today is but the LPI legislation, so that's basically Section 51 following of the, of the 95 Act, didn't create a simple statutory minimum for pension increases. Now, obviously, we know that it changed in 2005, so the, the cap for the minimum increase was it went from being inflation at 5% to inflation at 2.5%. But the, the more fundamental point is that there wasn't one statutory minimum that needed to be observed in all cases. Um, but instead, there was a twin track approach which was contained in the legislation, which, which has the scope to create complexities. So looking here at the legislation in the form until 2011, it was updated a bit um, as a result of the coalition government's decision in 2010. But of course, most scheme rules will predate that change. So they thought to be construed in accordance with uh, this legislation. The, the, the legislation allowed you effectively two ways of complying. So the default was that the pension was increased by what was called the appropriate percentage. So that's within Section 51.2 of the 95 Act. And the appropriate percentage is a read across to the revaluation percentage that already existed for the purpose of statutory evaluation. So under the Pension Schemes Act 1993, Schedule 3, which was expressed very precisely to uh, be inflation over the year uh, measured in the way that was the Secretary of State's estimate of the general increase in retail prices. In other words, it wasn't specific about what index he or she used for that purpose. It just needed to be his or her estimate, um, according to the caps. But where it was unspecific about index, it was specific about reference period because it mandated that you use the September reference period. So that was the default. But that default only applied if you hadn't got a scheme specific exception applying. And this is the second track of the twin track represented by section 51.3. And that applied if the scheme included a rule which required increases by the relevant percentage. So we've got the contrast between the appropriate percentage and the relevant percentage. And the relevant percentage was uh, bizarrely um, oppositely defined. So it was very specific as to index. It, meant the increase in the RPI, subject to the relevant caps, but it was very agnostic about reference period. So whereas the appropriate percentage said it had to be the September period, uh, the scheme rules could select what reference period was applicable for the relevant percentage. So effectively to comply, you had to use uh, one of those two methods um, rather than there being an imposed unitary method. So. Broadly speaking, if we think about uh, the period between 1995 and 97, when schemes were getting ready, thinking, how do we uh, comply with the legislation? What do we have to do to our rules to become compliant with the new legislation? It seems to me that the 95 Act was offering schemes a choice about how to comply. You either put in a rule, which uh, means you have to put in a rule requiring RPI increases, and if you do that, that you can, you can adapt the rule so that it uses whatever reference period you want. 
Or alternatively, you just do nothing and accept the overriding default regime, which is uh, using the revaluation uh, percentages selected by the Secretary of State for revaluation, so September reference period. And I suppose you have to say there's a third possibility, isn't there, which is you can have a rule that you script yourself, which will create demands as a matter of construction, which happens not to fit within the safe harbour exception of Section 513, i.e. not to be a rule requiring RPI increases within that, that provision. And the net result of that will be that you'll have to do the better of what your rule requires and what the overriding regime requires in every year. So uh, going back to 2010, of course, the Secretary of State's change of practice, not through into the escalation, because it meant that anybody who'd adopted the uh, the do nothing approach and, and just applied the defaulting overriding regime found to their employers' delight that the increases stopped being calculated by reference to RPI and started being calculated uh, by reference to CPI for future reference periods. But if you were in the first category, if you had chosen to comply by scripting a rule by reference to RPI, you weren't in that fortunate position from the employer's point of view, and indeed you were castigated by. Uh, by, by the government at the time as having you know, chosen to script an RPI provision, which meant that you didn't really deserve a, a relaxation, as it was put. And there was no well, there was great resistance by the, the government to any suggestion that there should be a Section 68 modification power allowing people to rewrite those rules. But it does look rather odd, doesn't it, when you think about it in this way, which is the legislation was really saying there's an overall objective here of creating an escalation protection. Um, and there are two ways of complying with it, one of which happens to require RPI to be hard-coded, the other which doesn't. Now, looking forward, the, um, the observation I would make is that this statutory framework has to be relevant to the construction of pension scheme rules, which include, for example, a power to change index. Uh, and my suggestion on that score is based upon uh, long-standing principles of construction I put there on the slide, Lord Hoffman in National Grid and Law, so a long time ago, but more recently and personally perhaps Lord Hodge in Bernardo's. Uh, the references in both those cases are to tax legislation, but tax legislation is just one form of legislation. The framework in which pension schemes are made, that's to say the framework of, of obligations as a matter of, uh, if you like, public law, uh, whether that's tax or social security, are relevant to the construction of the things that people do within that arena, I suggest, and, and need to be taken into account when um, uh, provisions are construed. Now, it has to be said, though, that um, this dual uh, arrangement that, that was put in 1995 Act was not really the subject of comment by uh, judges. In fact, in the Kinetic case in, in 2011, the first of the series, series of cases about indexation, uh, power change, powers to change indexation. Uh, there's a statement about the statutory minimum was, uh, I think, not consistent with what I've described. It, it was as if there was just one statutory minimum. So the big question is, what needs to be true for the rules of the scheme to require a pension to increase by at least RPI and subject to caps? In other words, how do you bring yourself within the Section 513 safe harbour exception so that you don't have an override? Or to put it negatively, how do you how did you find yourself with a rule which leaves you stuck with RPI? Um, and that's a question that was looked at in a case earlier this year, the Britvic case. There's quite a lot to say about this case. We can only look at just this one point, but notice the, the interesting nature of the rule. So the rate of the increase, it said, uh, in relation to escalation, is a percentage increase in RPI during the year ending the previous 31 May, but subject to the caps. And then it goes on, or any other rate decided by the principal employer. So what is that? Well, on the one hand, the fact that the reference period has been deliberately chosen to be May, and there's no suggestion of September, might suggest that there's an intention to have a rule which is requiring RPI increases on a reference period chosen by the scheme. But on the other hand, depending on how you construe it, the saving or any other rate decided by the principal employer might suggest that you aren't within that, um, that safe harbour of, uh, of RPI increase subject caps because there's the scope for the principal employer to do something else. And it was argued by Britvic potentially to put a lower rate in, um, something they hadn't done before, but something that they, want, they argued that they had the full power to do. 
Now, this came for a decision before, it's on a judge, judge Hodge QC, sitting as a deputy judge. And in the context of this legislation and some other factors, he perhaps surprisingly in some ways construed the rule as saying that uh, uh, the any other rate option decided by the principal employer was actually rather narrower than the literal words indicated, because it must have been intended to mean uh, any higher rate. In other words, uh, relevantly from the point of view of Section 513, there was intended to be a Section 513 rule, uh, which meant that there needed to be an increase of at least RPI uh, subject to caps, and that the discretion read in that context therefore couldn't go lower than, uh, than, than, than the cap. Um, it's fair to say that that case involved other factors too. There was a transfer, uh, and the, during the transfer, the members had received transfer invitations, which stated that there was a minimum to the increases, which was represented by the RPI capped rate. Um, and it was consistent with those sorts of statements that the judge reached the conclusion he did about the meaning of those rules. He was able to say, he thought, that something had gone wrong with the language, sufficient to enable him to depart from a, a very literal interpretation. But he did accept that, um, excuse me, that the power of the LPI legislation was a relevant factor of construction. In other words, that uh, he found that the intention had been to bring the scheme within Section 51.3, and that was a relevant factor in contributing to the decision he made uh, about uh, the construction of any other rate to mean only any other higher rate. So where does that leave us? Well, I, I, my time's a bit limited, I've been hurry on. Um, I think the main point we want to look at is the potential for a knock-on effect here with Section 67. You'll know that uh, early in this sequence, Section 67 was a live issue. So in those cases, at first instance, I put on the, the screen and also the Court of Appeal, Court of Appeal primarily in Buckingham Bernardo's. Um, uh, they, they all adopted the, the line of thinking, well, the members have a right to an increase at either index A or index B. And if you've got an accrued right to A or B, you haven't got an accrued right to either A or B, so that Section 67 isn't engaged and there's no detrimental effect if that power is ex exercised. Uh, but it does seem to me that there is some potential, there's plenty of other things to say about Section 67 too, but some potential that the close analysis of the LPI legislation might make the analysis that's been preferred in those cases less attractive, less obviously true. In other words, if uh, you've got a rule which requires RPI increases subject to caps, which looks from all the available evidence within the admissible backgrounds if it was intended to comply with section 51.3, but it's coupled with a power to change index, it doesn't really look as if the rights to A or B, it looks more like it's a right to A unless the power is exercised to B. And if that's the correct characterization, that starts to look a little more like the exercise of that power is not uh, uh, just giving them one of his alternative rights, but actually a modification of the regime that applies for pension increase, which which might point to it being a power to modify, which couldn't be detrimentally affected without offending Section 67. So I do wonder whether uh, the closer attention that's been paid to this dual structure in the LPI regime, particularly in the Griffith case, might potentially have this knock-on effect on Section 67, but we'll have to see. Now, with that, I, I want to um, hand back over to the next speaker, who is Lydia, Lydia Seymour, who's going to look at... Um, a related question, I think, which is, uh, she's also going to talk about a case where there was uh, a discussion about whether you had a section 51.2 or section 51.3 uh, rule in play. So she's going to look at what you do when the considerations in the document point in conflicting ways and what you've really got is a, a messy piece of drafting. So Lydia, over to you. Thanks, Philip. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about Carr and Thales Pension Trustee Limited, um, a decision of Mr Justice Nugie on appeal from the Pensions Ombudsman that's from April of this year. I'll refer to it as Thales number two to distinguish it from a 2017 case involving the same set of schemes, which also dealt with RPI issues and which Nick Hill is going to be talking about shortly. So Thales number two was an RPI case at the opposite end of the scale to the Britvic case that Philip was just talking about. 
Britvic looked at the scope of a power to choose an index where Thales was a question of, of winner takes all. Uh, it was a question of construction, properly analysed, did this pension increase rule require hardwired RPI or hardwired statutory increases? I've put the rule uh, on the slide there and I followed the approach that Mr Justice Nugi took by inserting numbering, which obviously wasn't present in the rule itself, to explain the issue that the court had to determine. And looking at the rule, you can see that it's in has been put into two parts. Firstly, the percentage increase in the retail prices index over the year ending 30 September to the calendar year prior to that in which the increase is due to take place, subject to a maximum of 5%, and that's our RPI default that Philip was talking about. And then the second limb, as specified by order under Section 2 of Schedule 3 of the Pension Schemes Act. Now, when this rule was first drafted, which was in May 2000, limb 1 and limb 2 matched. Limb 1 was RPI to a maximum of 5%, and the statutory reference um, at the Limb 2, Section 2 of Schedule 3 of the Pension Schemes Act, was also RPI to a maximum of 5%. But as we know, and Richard was talking about, in mid-2000, the government switched to CPI for evaluation orders, and from then on, Limb 1 of the rule provided RPI max 5%, and Limb 2 was a statutory reference which now provided for CPI. So, it was a messily drafted provision that always had a latent inconsistency and which from 2010 onwards contained, I can see I've gone a slide too far, contained a, a, an actual inconsistency with limb one and limb two referring to different levels of increase. So which limb should be given primacy was the Thales number two question. And as Mr. Justice Nugi put it, that's an easy question to state, but not an entirely easy one to resolve. It was in some ways an unusual construction issue because there's no ambiguity in the words themselves. Often uh, issues as to construction are focused on the proper meaning of words or what they mean in their proper context. But here there was no question about what the words of the clause meant. They were clear and unambiguous. Unfortunately, the first limb of the clause clearly and unambiguously required hardwired RPI, whilst the second limb clearly and unambiguously pointed to CPI from 2010 onwards. There's no way to construe the two limbs as consistent, and whilst the court put the question as which of the two limbs should be given primacy, in many ways that was a gloss, they are irreconcilable, and the question really is which one should be adopted and which one should be ignored. So when you've got messy drafting like this, where does the court go? Well, I'll start with two uh, places that Thales teaches us that the court shouldn't go, um, but which were canvassed during the hearing. Mr Justice Nugi raised two possible areas which might assist in resolving this problem of where you've got two inconsistent limbs to a clause. First, he asked, isn't there a principle that the earlier of two inconsistent provisions should take precedence? Um, this was just before lunchtime, and so we all scurried off uh, to try and work out the answer. And it appears from Chitty that there was an old rule that where different parts of an instrument are inconsistent, the earlier clause is to be preferred. Uh, that said, you'll see in the uh, section of, the, of Chitty that I've just uh, put up on the slide, the final sentence says that this rule was a mere rule of thumb, totally unscientific and out of keeping with the modern construction of documents. Uh, not enthusiastic then, there was somewhat more encouragement to be found in the current version of Lewison on this point, which suggested the principle can still be applicable, although only as a last resort. So on the question of whether there's a shortcut here, where you simply apply the first part of an inconsistently drafted clause, the answer appears to be no, or possibly yes, but only as a very last resort. It doesn't take us very far. The second possibility that Mr Justice Nugi raised was whether there's any help to be obtained from the authorities which deal with conveyances of land, where sometimes the written description of the land being conveyed is different to the area of the land that's marked on an accompanying plan. Now, to save everybody from falling down the same rabbit hole that I did, the short answer to this is no, uh, those conveyancing authorities are not any help. There is a wealth of authority, it turns out, on what as apparently a rather common problem of people describing one plot of land in the written description and then marking another on the attached plan. But what those authorities tell us is that the judge is entitled to have regard to the actual situation on the ground, and it's using the word ground in a literal rather than metaphorical sense, to determine which of two inconsistent descriptions is correct. 
Now, not for want of trying, we couldn't identify any coherent analogy between that principle and anything which could be relevant to the construction of pension scheme rules. And so interesting as it was, uh, the point rather fell away. So where did the court go? Well, having got no help from old rules of thumb and conveyancing authorities, uh, the court in Thales number two, in fact, went on to apply wholly orthodox principles of construction started with the well-known principles in Bernardo's and the importance of giving weight to textual analysis and the natural and ordinary meaning of the words. There was nothing in the rule itself, and I've put it back up there, to indicate which limb should take precedence in the event of ambiguity, presumably because it never occurred to the drafts person that the two limbs could diverge. So what was the natural and ordinary meaning of the words in the clause? Mr. Justice Nugy considered that their natural and ordinary meaning was hardwired RPI. As to why he considered that, he very honestly said, it's not always easy to articulate with precision why one reading of a disputed phrase seems more natural and ordinary than another. The way in which language strikes a reader as an accumulation of their experience and how language is ordinarily used, but doing his best to try to explain why he preferred uh, limb one, he took the view that limb one was essentially identifying what the rate was, whilst limb two told the reader where they could find that rate. He accepted that the implication of this was that limb two had to be completely ignored, um, but either one or the other limb would have to be ignored given the irreconcilable clash. The decision goes on to consider whether in this case there was any reason to diverge from the normal, the natural and ordinary meaning, um, and Mr Justice Nugy concluded there was none. In his view, neither hardwired RPI nor hardwired statutory increases made any more or less commercial sense, which would have been a potential ground for diverging from the natural and ordinary meaning test that was identified in Rainy Sky and Cookman Bank. He also took the view that both meanings gave a reasonable and practical effect to the scheme in the sense referred to by uh, Mr Justice Millett in Courage. And ultimately, whichever of hardwired RPI or hardwired CPI was chosen, he took the view the provision was workable and practical and did what it was plainly intended to do, i.e. provide protection against inflation to pensioners. So where does this take us on the broader topic of RPI, other than hopefully saving you all from wasting too much time looking at convincing authorities. Well, starting with the obvious, try to avoid drafting inherently contradictory pension increase rules. Uh, if you're intending to reflect the statutory requirements, the more direct the reference, uh, the better. Um, moving on to what it contributes to the RPI debate. Well, perhaps the key point is that the RPI debate appears to have played little or no part in the court's thinking. A number of arguments relating specifically to RPI were advanced in argument before the court, many of the points that are being canvassed in this seminar. But in the opinion of Mr. Justice Nugy, this Thales number two case was a pure issue of construction. The very fact that the court invited submissions about old rules of construction and conveyancing authorities demonstrates the extent to which this was a pure exercise of construction, wholly independent from the subject matter and the history uh, of RPI. The court was unpersuaded by the arguments that were put forward that relate to RPI CPI and this was very much in contrast to the Britvic decision that uh, Philip has just been talking about. In particular the court didn't accept the submission that primacy should as a matter of principle be afforded to the statutory reference and nor did Mr Justice Nugy feel that it was in any way relevant that the government had chosen to adopt CPI. Um, that was no reason in his view to uh, prefer that reading to hardwired RPI. Uh, he didn't accept that hardwiring statutory increases made any more commercial sense than hardwired RPI, nor that the reflecting of statutory provisions gave any more reasonable or practical effect to the scheme. And he also rejected any submission or suggestion that a dynamic interpretation of the clause pointed away from hardwired RPI, and dynamic interpretation is a point that David will speak about in more detail in a moment. And perhaps, I think most tellingly, he accepted that the intention of the drafts person was to reflect the statutory requirement, but considered that this didn't assist in any way in determining what the words actually meant. And so the conclusion of my short section is just that whilst Thales number two is certainly not sufficient to suggest that the courts have a predisposition for RPI, it is certainly an example of a case in which the court had no predisposition against it. 
Uh, with that, I will hand over to David Grant. Thank you, Lydia. Wait, I will now start to share my screen in a second, if you'll bear with me. We should pick up where we left off. Lydia has spoken about the problems of inconsistency in the context where that inconsistency arose over time. I want to look more generally at the effect of time or the passage of time on construction. And we're going to start with Bernardo's, which I suggest is a good place to start for most questions of pensions construction. I've set out on the screen the third, fourth and fifth of Lord Hodge's characteristics of a pension scheme. Be well known to all of you. The third identifies the long term feature of a pension scheme. The fourth writes on parties many years after the scheme was initiated. Fifthly, the fact that members of the scheme may not have had easy access to expert legal advice. The third and fourth are most obviously relevant to the question of the passage of time, but you'll see why the fifth characteristic is pertinent for this talk. Those factors all support um, a focus on textualism rather than contextualism. One can see that from Bernardo itself. And at the bottom of this slide, I've shown that the um, takeaway point that the court should give weight to textual analysis. One can also see that from two previous cases, Safeway, nothing to do with indexation, but the judgment of Lord Briggs as he'd become by the time of the hand down, stating that the, the context was inherently antipathetic to the recognition by way of a departure from plain language of some common understanding between the principal employer and the trustees or common dictionary which they may have employed. That was in the context as to whether the practice of amending by announcement might in some way have influenced the proper construction of the power of amendment, but the words hold true to our present context. Also there's the BT case in which Andrew amongst others was involved and I've given you specific references to the judgment there. So all those um, features support textualism. Philip's case of Britvic shows us that the absence of one or more of those features can support a lesser focus on textualism. I'm not going to go over the facts of Britvic. Suffice to say that um, His Honour Judge Hodge was at pains to stress that the decision was highly sensitive to the facts of the present case. The Britvic scheme was created by transfer and thus always closed to new entrants. The transferring members expressly consented to such transfers. And he also placed a high importance upon the role of member communications. He accepted the submission from Keith Bryant that the fourth and fifth of Lord Hodge's characteristics were absent. And he said that that gave a greater need to adopt a proposal of construction relying upon the benefits summary. And indeed, he went so far as to say that something had clearly gone wrong with the language of the phrase, I read, or any other rate decided by the principal employer, which of course he construes as being, or any higher rate decided by the principal employer. The fact that Britvic um, shows us the possible difference when there's an absence of the fourth and the fifth characteristics raises the more general question as to whether the long-term nature of a pension scheme is a reason to favor Textualism or not. Tal is in car, Tal is number two, if you call it, Tal is 2020, is a case where the express words remained the same as Lydia's explained, but the words incorporated had a change of meaning, or the change of the underlying statute. I want to consider two other situations. The first is where the wording itself changes with time. The second is where the wording remains, but you might say that the world changes. Both of those issues were one way or the other in front of the court in Atos. I've set out on the slide the specific two questions before Mr Justice Nuji and his answers. On the first question, which was really the change of um, the world with time, he concluded that the wording, the general index of retail prices or items published by the ONS was RPI and remained so. As to whether the wording changed over time meant that the, mean, the words where that index is not published change meaning, he said effectively no, where that index is not published for any purpose, which in other words meant where it was not made public. We've now moved on to the actual wording in Atos. The evolution of the deeds in Atos is a talk into itself. 
So I'll pass by this very, very quickly. In essence, the um, predecessor scheme, the Siemens scheme, initially there was no defined term. By 2007 there was, it was repeated in 2008. Three weeks before the deed, which was in front of the court in Atos, was a deed of amendment, which is currently on slide 21. And there's a colour coding. There were basically five different elements of the wording, depending when they arose and when they survived. Slide 22 shows the actual wording in front of the court. It's colour coding there. I'm not going to spend time now. Suffice to say that the judge was not persuaded by our arguments that the change of the wording, the introduction of the blue words, a new final clause, meant that one had to um, alter or adjust the meaning of a predecessor part of that clause. He rejected the presumption against redundancy and came to that is of the plain meaning, which he favoured in the end, despite that not really being the primary um, contention of either party. So that was the second issue before the court in Atos. But what I really want to focus on is the first issue, the evolution of the world over time. And the point is that the wording of a scheme can often have been coined many editions or iterations before. And other things being equal, you look at the uh, meaning of the words when first coined. As a matter of general construction, a provision can, the meaning of the provision can be static on the one hand, or it can be dynamic or mobile on the other. And in the latter case, the meaning of the words are not necessarily frozen at the date of the instrument. Lewison um, has a particularly good passage on dynamic construction and notes the fact that the dynamic approach is particularly apposite in the case of a constitutional document, such as in Articles of Association. Begs the question, why wouldn't it be in the case of a pension scheme, given its long-term feature? There's also the argument by analogy that statutes are always speaking. And one can think of a range of um, statutory provisions, criminal, public or the like, a whole range of cases where the courts have had to grapple with the words of the Offences Against the Persons Act 1861 in the context of modern technology and the like. And the final point, and perhaps the most persuasive one, is that in the 2011 Stenner case, Lady Justice Arden accepted the submission of one Mr Spink that the meaning of a provision may change on each reintroduction if the context in which it is re-adopted is materially different. So that is a snapshot of dynamic construction and leads on to the deployment for the first time in a pensions case of a Supreme Court case called Lloyd's TSB Foundation for Scotland. It's a Scottish case which went to the Supreme Court. Basically it was all about the meaning of um, pre-tax profit. A um, covenant in 1997 a 2005 change made a radical change to accountants in practice. And the key point in this case was that it would have turned a loss of in excess of 10 billion into a profit in excess of 1 billion, even though this wasn't a real or realized gain. And the um, charity, the benefit of the covenant, said, well, we'd like our um, appropriate percentage of the pre-tax profits. Um, the outer um, court in Scotland initially found for um, the bank, the inner house found for the um, charity and the Supreme Court um, restored the position in favour of the bank. And the real question, we paraphrase slightly the words of Lord Mance, is a paragraph 23 of his judgment. That question is this, how is the language best operate in the fundamentally changed and entirely unforeseen circumstances in the light of the party's original intentions and purposes. In Lloyd's TSB, the Supreme Court concluded that you should apply the entry line in the accounts, which would have answered to the original definition back in 1997, not the answer that would have been given post the radical change in 2005. They said this wasn't a question of rewriting the deed, as the inner house had concluded, but simply a question of giving effect to the party's original intentions. Said, that case had not been, at least to my knowledge, previously deployed in a pensions case, even though some of us had talked about it in the context of indexation several years ago. The essence of um, Atos's argument was this. Atos said that the changes to the status of RPI post-2011 was equally extraordinary as the change in accountancy practice in Lloyd's TSB Foundation. 
and Atlas contended that it couldn't be said that the drafts person, to use a neutral phrase, intended the scheme to be tied to what Atlas categorised as a conceptually and operatively flawed index, which the um, Office of National Statistics did not consider to be fit for purpose. Mr Justice Nugy set out our submissions in quite some detail in his judgment, but concluded that the argument was unsound as it was ingenious. The essential difference, as he saw it, was this. In Lloyd's, the deployment of the um, purposive construction meant that the wording had the same meaning as had been intended and as it had in 1997. Profits meant not what was shown in the accounts in 2009, but the profits as they were understood in 1997. In Atlas, we were seeking to come to the opposite conclusion. So sorry, I've jumped a few slides. There we go. Now, that's all well and good, but Ms. Justice Nugent's response didn't really engage with the demise of RPI. And here, I beg the question as to whether there is a role for the question of propriety in helping to support a dynamic construction and the deployment of the Lloyd's arguments. Now, it's trite that the purpose of a rule providing for increases is to protect against inflation. I've given you a reference to Mr. Justice Warren's judgment in Bernardo's. That said, the courts have repeatedly been resistant to abstract appeals. Again, two references for you there in Tallis, number one, and in BT. But the question I'm going to pose now is, have we come to a point where the change to the status of RPI is so fundamental that it's currently so inappropriate or improper measure of inflation that the employer and the trustees are free not to use it, even if it's still published? Put another way, in the language of Lord Mance, how does the language best operate, or rather, does language best operate to commit a scheme to a flawed index? Now, these are um, interesting and perhaps difficult questions. I would suggest that there is um, legal um, scope for the re-examination of them and clearly commercial incentive. And on the question of how the courts can react to changes over time, I'm going to hand over to Nicholas Hill, who's going to talk about another case. Thank you. And if I stop sharing. Thank you very much, David. So David's spoken about dynamic interpretations and um, how the court has grappled to date with such interpretations. I'm going to try and look at a slightly more granular element of a couple of the cases to date and look at how the courts have reacted to changes in composition and compilation. I'm going to do that through the prism of two cases, the Tireless uh, 2017 judgment of Mr Justice Warren and the Arup case from earlier this year where I acted for the company led by Nick Storworthy QC. I've set out the two um, scheme provisions that were subject to the court's consideration on that first slide. So in Tireless, it turned on whether the compilation of the RPI was materially changed. And in Arup, the case turned on whether the composition of the index had changed. Crucial and obvious distinction there being the requirement for materiality in the Tireless case. Like David, uh, in Arup, we sought to persuade the courts of the value of reading across what Lord Mance had said in Lloyd's to consider the radically different legal and statistical context the court was considering at that time. But before we want to talk a little bit more about the two rules in issue, I set out something of a warning by reference to what Lord Justice Lewison said of Bernardo's being that other scheme provisions are utterly irrelevant unless they set down a principle of interpretation. And indeed, what Mr. S Mr. Justice Nugy said in Atos, that no direct assistance can be gleaned from other provisions in other schemes. Nonetheless, with that warning in mind, my starting point, and I hope my uncontroversial starting point, is that any credible index of consumer prices will never be static. It must be dynamic. It must evolve. It must adjust to uh, the different items that people buy to stay uh, relevant and reasonable. And of course, that submission uh, was quickly acceded to by the court in Thailand, in Arab, indeed in the um, BT case in front of Mr. Justice Zaccaroli as well. And I've set out some of the quotations from those judgments. In Thailand, Mr. Justice Warren accepted the evidence from the trustees expert, Jewel Leyland, that lifestyles and goods and services 
and the information and techniques available can alter radically over time. He said that changes designed to adapt to this are simply part of the ordinary good management of an index to ensure it remains true to its fundamental purpose. So that dynamic nature is inherent to a properly compiled index of consumer prices. Similar language used by his honor judge David Cook in Arab. His honor judge Cook went a little bit further. He said that in the Arab case, where the particular um, provision was adopted, where the use of RPI was first incorporated in 1992, the parties to the deed must have been taken as knowing that they were adopting an index that would be subject to dynamic changes, to evolving, to continually improving as the publishing authority sought to make it a better measure of consumer prices. I'm going to look at three particular changes that were canvassed or, or flagged up by Richard when he opened the seminar a little earlier. The 2010 change in the way clothing and footwear was analysed, the freeze in 2013, and the 2017 change in the way housing cost data was incorporated. And look at how the courts have um, considered those three changes as schemes have wrestled with indexation provisions. I'm going to look at one and three quite quickly and focus really on the freeze, which is where I say the courts to date have not shown themselves as reacting sensibly and sensitively to relevant changes. The 2010 change is well known. It was um, designed to reflect the bounce back in prices after an item in the basket had been produced on sale. It was not originally then included in the basket when it uh, came back to the normal price because other products were not deemed as comparable. So in 2010, price collectors were asked to relax, in effect, what was considered comparable. So the bounce back in prices was better reflected in the index. It was intended to be a minor change. It was a routine methodological improvement. But as uh, Mr. Justice Zaccaroli said in BT, it had a dramatic effect. And you've heard from Richard already that the impact on the formula effect, or the impact of the formula effect, was exacerbated up to, I think he said, 1%. In Tales, it was not a material change in compilation. Because although, of course, it was a change in compilation, it was not material. It was only, in fact, a minor change with material effects and consequences. We didn't have that problem in Arab because our, our language is very different. And there the court was persuaded to accept that the effect of any change may not be immediately apparent. Uh, indeed, the ONS may not be aware of the impact of any particular change when it makes it. Moreover, uh, His Honour Judge Cook accepted that trustees, employees, indeed advisors to schemes may not be aware of the impact of a particular change when it's made. So in Arab, the judge said that in the absence of any specific time horizon type provision, the rule to allow an adjustment to calculations using the index would not be restricted in time, even though the effect of the change was not really understood until some time later. So there, depending on the particular um, clause in issue, the courts have shown themselves willing to allow changes to calculations using the index in appropriate circumstances. 2017 was much more straightforward. Uh, we all know that in Arab, the parties agree that the change in housing components was a relevant change in composition. In Tyler's 2017, again, it was more difficult, but nonetheless, the court accepted it was a material change, not least because the Bank of England had classified it as a fundamental change. And in effect, um, the reference population had been changed uh, the 4% income, highest income levels, and pensions on state benefits were included in the new UK HPI data. So again, the court was willing um, to take into account that sort of change. Where uh, the court has differed in my analysis so far is in terms of the freeze in 2013. As Richard set out at the beginning of his talk, the freeze emerged from the um, increase in the formula effect as the clothing change took effect after 2010. And there was the ONS investigation and consultation and the decisions by the then national statistician to freeze RPI in 2013. Uh, John Pullinger, when he became national statistician sometime thereafter, clarified in March 2016 that the RPI would still be subject <coughs> to routine improvement. Uh, but, he said, uh, the ONS would only consider making methodological changes to RPI if to not do so would inhibit the improvement of CPIH and the Consumer Prices Index. And I've set out there what Mr Justice Warren said about the freeze in paragraph 33 of uh, the Tyler's decision. He said, of course, there wasn't really a change at all. And that's consistent 
with his dismissal of the freeze in the judgment. He held there wasn't a change of compilation. No one, in fact, knows what it really means. And it was so opaque and its consequences so unpredictable that it cannot sensibly be described as a change of compilation at all. So he set that high bar uh, to what a change of compilation may be. The freeze was similarly dismissed in Arab by David Cook. He said that the result of the change of compilation were not made rather than they were made. And in BT, Mr. Justice Zaccaroli said that because the routine improvements would continue to be made, uh, it was still fit for purpose. But just pausing there, if we consider the significance of the freeze, of what the Johnson Review said about this was now a legacy measure that would not be made a more correct measure of inflation, that it was no longer in effect fit for purpose and should not be used. Similarly, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee reports that Richard referred to, the UK SA is publishing an index which it admits is flawed but refuses to fix. And crucially, I say, we now see divergence as uh, methodological and technical improvements are made to CPI and CPIH, which are not being incorporated into RPI. And we see that from a 2018 ONS article on the consumer price inflation basket of goods and services. And there we see that additional price quotes for fruit and vegetables were now being included in CPI and CPIH, but were not being incorporated into RPI because, of course, only routine changes were being made. So that brings me uh, full circle. Is uh, those changes, the fact that changes that are now being made as the technical development of the indices improves, the fact that they're not being incorporated into RPI, does that mean that RPI remains a dynamic, non-static, evolving index, the type of index that these schemes adopted in 1992 or whenever the provisions were first coined? We, I set out that, of course, the, the, the index must evolve to follow changes in society, to quote Tyler's lifestyle and product availability, as well as new sources of information or statistical techniques. And I've identified that 2018 change from the Consumer Price Inflation Basket of Goods and Services article, new information which is not being incorporated, not being taken into account. And moreover, and further to that um, point, if the parties, as the court said in Arab, were taken to have a deliberately adopted an index that would not be static, where the publishing body would always be striving to keep it up to date and evolving in accordance with technical standards, is it really correct that the RPI does that any longer in circumstances where a line is drawn between routine and non-routine improvements? Jill Leyland's evidence in Thales was that lifestyles and goods and services and the information and techniques available can radically alter over time. She said changes designed to adapt to this are simply part of the ordinary good management of an index to ensure it remains true to its fundamental purpose. Well, in my submission, if all but routine changes are being taken out of RPI, it is no longer true to that fundamental purpose. So I conclude that schemes that have a second limb type argument here, a composition or compilation type gateway, are still ripe for consideration. And in fact, I suggest that as further divergence from CPI and CPIH takes place, we're much more likely to see courts more willing to see to arguments about adjustments to calculations using the index, about changes in composition and changes in compilation. Now, I'm acutely aware that it's 10 past six on a very hot Monday. So I'm going to stop the share and invite Andrew Spink uh, to pop back up and field any questions. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, everybody else uh, who's spoken so well, David, Lydia, uh, Philip and Richard. Um, it is indeed uh, a long, hot afternoon. Uh, I'm looking to check and see if there are any questions. Uh, as far as I can see, there aren't any. Um, if anybody wants to put a question in, either on the chat function, which is what I referred to, or the Q&A, which uh, Philip referred to, um, by all means, uh, do. Otherwise, um, I will proceed to thank you all for attending. We've had a very good attendance and considering the time, very kind of all of you to stay till the end. Some very interesting points raised by all of our speakers. Um, I, I think the point made at the end by um, Nick uh, about the fitness for purpose of RPI is a very apposite and important one. And uh, although 
uh, on the construction argument in Atos, we lost uh, on the uh, particular uh, basis that's been explained to you by one of the other speakers. A lot of time was spent in that case taking Mr. Justice Nugi through the updated history, that is the history in relation to RPI since the Zaccaroli judgment in BT. And um, I think it's a fair observation that the judge, Mr. Justice Nugi in Atos, was uh, quite uh, taken with the submission that, um, at least from the point of view of its own publisher, the ONS, um, RPI is not fit for purpose as a measure of inflation anymore. Uh, and I think you can see that in the judgment, although that wasn't a requirement for his judgment. Um, you can see that in that discussion. Um, and maybe in a different case where that was a critical factor, which it didn't turn out to be uh, on the, the wording of the rule in Atos, that would be the way in. Um, it's perfectly clear that the view of the ONS and the UKSA is that uh, it is not a fit for purpose inflation index. Um, and uh, that, as Nick has rightly said, uh, is an important consideration. Okay, I've managed to talk us into a question um, which has just come in from Rachel Hunter. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to read it out and then uh, I will invite the panellists while I read it to consider who they think is the best person to answer it. On the Ove Arup decision, does the timing point about the change to the gateway needing to be since the most recent amendment and restatement of the scheme rules mean that in practical terms, the 2010 and 2013 changes will no longer be relevant for most schemes, as many schemes will have amended and restated their rules at some point in the last five to 10 years? Um, volunteers, please. I think that's probably for me. I thought it might be, but I didn't want to volunteer. <laughs> I think the short answer is that that may well be right. But uh, in Arab, uh, the position was we weren't in a position to lead any evidence about the re-adoption of the index at the relevant time. There may be schemes where you can positively lead evidence demonstrating that there was no reconsideration to uh, dislodge the judge's conclusion that you had to accept that the trustees had considered it fit for purpose when the consolidated scheme rules were passed in that case. So I think it's a further argument that needs to be considered in the particular circumstances of any particular scheme. Certainly in Arab, it was an unhelpful conclusion. And we were um, obviously not striving for that conclusion in the way we presented it in our case. Uh, but I don't think it's fatal to the argument. It just makes it more difficult. May I go next on that? Because not a similar issue was um, live in BT. This is my clever cue to invite Andrew to speak on this, which is um, the question of whether there was an effective resetting of the clock. And I think from recollection, Andrew, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that the answer was no, there wasn't. You could have regard to matters in the past, but it wouldn't be determinative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've answered that particularly quickly because, first of all, um, I know that you didn't want me to answer questions. You wanted me to leave it to you guys. But also, more importantly, another question's come in uh, from Tristan Manda, which I think I'm going to ask Richard to deal with first. Uh, will Brexit have any impact on the compilation of CPI? Richard, can you go on that one? Uh, I, was I was trying to be brief on this one. So, uh, so yes, I'm sure is the short answer to this. I uh, explained in my talk that I mean, CPI is, 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 a, is an EU rule book published by Eurostat. Um, and CPI is the uh, the UK's implementation of it. And effectively, it is hostage, if it continues to follow that rule book, uh, to move in line with uh, decisions by, you know, at the European level. Um, at the moment, CPIH is defined as CPI modified for some housing costs. Uh, and so at the moment, any changes at the European level would feed directly through CPIH. I, I do think this is an issue with the UK's preferred measure of inflation now, CPIH, being tied to, uh, to, to EC directives and Eurostat post-Brexit. And I don't think it's, it's one that has been unravelled as yet. And of course, at the moment, CPIH being a pure UK construct has the ability, you know, the EU owners have the ability to publish it and modify it any, any way they like. Um, I think that, that's just worth bearing in mind. There are, in a sense, fewer checks and controls 
at the UK local level um, around CPI and CPIH than there were than there are around RPI, uh, just because RPI has this elevated status as as our index of bond index. I mean, obviously, in these talks, we haven't touched on um, the separate question of what uh, trustees considering um, an alternative index, if they're a gateway enabling a switch to be made, has been passed through what the factors are that would be taken into account. And that's a completely different talk. But it is, are the, are the, just on this particular point, do you think the, the, the possibility of Brexit affecting the position uh, is something that trustees should have regard to? I think, I think absolutely. I'm not, and I, I don't think the, in a sense, it, it would be very helpful um, to wait for the, the ONS to come to a public landing as to... Uh, to what they're going to to do around the obviously the Brexit uh, agreement. I'm, like, I'm trying to turn a careful on and make sure I don't say anything that's not in the public domain, of course, in in this talk. Um, but I, it, you know, it must be a relevant point um, as to what the source of these indices are, who has power and control over them, um, and how they might be modified in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I. Just double checking uh, the chat and questions boxes and there don't seem to be any more questions. Um, I think uh, it's now 20 past six. Uh, I will draw stumps, um, to use probably a opposite analogy. Uh, and thank you again for your attendance. Uh, even now, most of you are still here. We do appreciate it. Uh, I hope everyone's well at the moment and surviving this prolonged period of um, disruption. Um, it's good at least to know that you're out there and willing to listen to uh, my colleagues and Richard speak uh, so well. I would like to thank them again. And uh, with that, we will draw proceedings to an end. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.